It's amazing. I never realized how much I was missing. Locked up in that room, trying to make a point, when all I really need to do is just to... He's going to talk about anger from a sociological perspective. <laughs> That's it. I now know my purpose. I'm going to put a stop to the charade once and for all. Now, where do I live again? Okay, that was weird. Anyway, emotions are bizarre. A natural response produced by advanced brains, what we call feelings are reactions to outside stimulation, developed by eons of survival. They are meant to help survival in a myriad of ways. One may ask, then, why our modern ideals seem to frown upon emotional responses in so many situations, such as job interviews, interrogations, during breakups, meeting parents. Well, all of these are emotionally very stressful situations, and yet we're told not to react. How unfair. People who are slaves to their emotions are viewed by others as somewhat helpless because their reactions are transparent. When one wears their feelings on their shirt sleeve, everyone can see their weaknesses and soft points. The world at large knows exactly how to hurt, frustrate, and beguile them. A prominent emotion that's almost always got a negative connotation attached to it is anger. It's one of the first ones we learn to express, and one of the first ones we're taught to suppress. It's kind of interesting how it's so ever-present in all aspects of a young life, and actually life in general is very anger-inducing. And yet, we have to learn how to hold back. Why is this? We want to avoid that. Sure, you can't rage out at every parking ticket, but despite popular practice, is there a healthy way to be angry and function within our society? Let's take as an example Adam Sandler's 2003 film, Anger Management. A Happy Madison production I can strangely recommend, this tale tells the story of David Busnick and his attempt to survive an average interaction with Jack Nicholson. Now, what would a movie that features scenes like this and this... The for cats isn't really a new idea, but there was never really a line made for overweight cats who... I have to say about the true nature of anger and its effects on society. Well, only one way to find out. Let's apply the lens of sociology to anger man. No! No, no! No! Not this time! Psycho! You have a beard! And you have some nerve! What the hell are you doing? Talking about anger, would you like to weigh in? You're stepping all over my field with the wrong tools and a less than ideal subject. Two strikes. First, you must peer inside the mind to appreciate what makes the three distinctive types of anger. Sure, interactions with others can give hints to what flavor boils inside, but it can't be used to diagnose it. You mean like this? There are two kinds of angry people, explosive and implosive. Explosive is the kind of individual that you see screaming at the cashier for not taking their coupons. Implosive is the cashier who remains quiet day after day and finally shoots everyone in the store. Because that seemed to work pretty well. Well, I'll give you this. That is a gross and incomplete simplification. Exactly the kind I would see in an Adam Sandler movie. I hear a pot calling a very successful kettle black. Have you succeeded at analyzing anything yet? <laughs> That's it. I'm proving you and your take on this film wrong. Stick around. It'll be fun to show how you're out of your element again. We start smack dab in the 70s, where our protagonist is taking part in a most stereotypical block party. <laughs> what was that? Oh, I've decided to keep track of all the elements that are shared throughout every single one of Adam Sandler's films. This particular one is a flashback to a bad childhood memory, just like Waterboy, Pixels... So your contribution to this review is counting things. Yes. Also, we can see plainly that David is the shy, reserved kid who never says boo to anyone, making him an easy target for the bully pulled straight from an after-school special on bullying. Here, at the moment where his mind is ready to receive that ever-overhyped first kiss, it instead experienced the greater impact of public humiliation due to his size. Me tug, doggy, yeah. What was that one for? 
I'll make note every single time that this movie insists phallic endowment be the core subject discussed in a scene. There can't be that many times it happens, right? When you see my final count, just remember, it was you who chose to watch this. No one forced you. It was you. Fast forward 25 years and David has a pretty good job, a nice girl, and the confidence of a 12-year-old boy. His boss walks all over him and he lets other men actively pose a threat to his relationship. Gatorade. Seriously? How are you not having Waterboy flashbacks watching this? In fact, why aren't you watching Waterboy? Because that one just shows anger, not the consequences. David on the plane, for instance, he lets someone push him out of his seat, which lands him next to Buddy, the friendliest, most non-threatening, good god those eyes guy you've ever met. What could possibly go wrong? Where's your headset? Excuse me. Could I maybe get that headset, please? Do not raise your voice to me, sir. I wasn't raising my voice. Is there a problem here, sir? I, I don't think so. Can you come to the back of the plane with me so we can have a talk? I just want to watch the movie. I'm only going to say this one more time, sir. Calm down. I'm calm! And he's immediately incarcerated upon landing. No, actually, he gets put on trial for assault against a flight attendant, Socio. This movie was set in 2003. 2003. He would be detained in a holding cell for months just for causing that plane to turn around. True, but what kind of movie would that be if he spent most of it behind bars? The Longest Yard remake. Wow. All of Adam Sandler movies are just multi-universe versions of one guy's story, aren't they? After the incident, David is sentenced to anger management classes, where we see John Turturro <laughs> as his polar opposite. I'm here because I was verbally attacked by my neighbor, and I took a dump on his porch. But I guess you're better than me. That's why you can't cop to your rage. You're superior, he's superior. Maybe Dave's not ready yet, Chuck. You're not ready. Seriously, his character is textbook intermittent explosive disorder. A common occurrence with the hasty and sudden anger. I think that's the first time I've heard you using terms from your field. I'm impressed. Shove it. Of all the film's faults, though, I have to give them credit for clearly describing two of the three types of anger. Explosive, as they call it, is hasty and sudden anger, while implosive, like David, is settled and deliberate. Both of these are episodic in nature, which is clearly shown. <laughs> Quite clearly. Jigman, wedgie, wedgie. What's the third kind? Dispositional anger, which is more of a characteristic than an active symptom. See, the traits of anger are embedded into every action, thought, and gesture that the subject makes. But it's not really episodic, it's more ever-present and persistent. So, Dr. House, pretty much. And who's at the center of all this orchestrated madness? Buddy Rydell, you know, Jack Nicholson from The Plane. He's the master pulling the strings of all these emotionally unstable individuals. Definitely agreed there. His absolute control over the psychology of so many people to fulfill this scheme is a masterstroke. <clears throat> Excuse me, he doesn't manipulate their minds, just their social interactions. Which he can only do by changing their perspective so they fall in line with his plan. But he changes the mindset of whole groups, not individuals on a case-by-case -case basis. Change perspective. Mind. Eyes. Stop it. To have such control over so many, you can't just lean on group dynamics there. That takes one-on-one -on -one conditioning. And lots of it. Y you know what? We need a referee. And, as your lightsaber makes contact with the second creature with the plant growing out of its back, it lets out one final IVSOR before dying. It's whipping fines, letting your comrades go. You collect yourselves and continue on. You're not far now, and you find the laboratory. And in you go, despite the force telling you, no, run away, do not go. You continue on, and then you see the maniacal professor. He turns to you and says, are you a boy or a girl? It makes no difference for my little pet. Dragonite, I choose you! Good old DM, settle something for us. Wait, us? Don't tell him I'm here. He probably heard that. Psycho, who gave you the green pages? Never mind that. He's saying that Buddy from Anger Management's a master of psychological manipulation, whereas I say he's got the social puppet mastering down. Who's right? Wait, who? Jack Nicholson's character. Oh, it's not often I say this, but Psycho has a point. Really? Yes! Finally! Yet, he's still wrong. Oh, I knew it. Even when I went at this, why does this even surprise me? While Riddell definitely knows the ins and outs of what fuels anger, 
It's not his extensive knowledge of the subject that gives him the edge. He has a whole community that assists in helping individuals realize through social interactions what their problems are. His knowledge helps shapes the course that he guides Davy through, but ultimately it's the players and buddies' troop through their interactions and goings-ons and goose fra bas that ultimately show him that he's got a serious anger issue that's really going to end one day with an AK-47 in an office full of tragedy. So, why am I wrong? He's herded these damaged people together somehow, and it wasn't from some already established group. He had to talk them into performing these tasks for him. Therefore, the psychology play came first. But without the network he made with them, Buddy wouldn't have the success that he does while utilizing this group of cured patients and his existing anger management group to highlight exactly how everyone has different states of anger and showing each facet of it. It's sociological experimentation with optimal results. Guys, guys. It's a chicken and egg argument here, alright? Think about it. They're both integral to the process. So why do we have to choose between the two of them? I have a very good expl- I don't know. That would make more sense, I suppose. You two agreed once upon a time. Would it be so bad to try again? I guess we could give it a try. But just wait one second. So, sh do you promise not to try and kill me this time? Depends. Are you going to insult ballet? I've learned my lesson. Then we should be good. Glad I could solve yet another marital dispute between you two. Bills in the mail. So anyways. <clears throat> oh yes, the Dragonite flaps its wings, growls angrily, and flies at you at supersonic speeds. Bacchus, you're up! I force jump onto its tail! Bacchus, for the last time, you don't have force jump. Well, did not jump anyway! 20! <gasps> Woo! <laughs> Guess you might have force jump after all. As a Jedi! As a Jedi! <laughs> Buddy accompanies David in his everyday activities, finding the faults the man's failing to address in all aspects of his life. What are you doing here? Well, I just played golf with Frank. He's friends with my dad, and we're all members of the same country club. I deserve this! I deserve this! <laughs> the movie does focus on that topic a bit, doesn't it? <clears throat> oh, I saw your boy Andrew at the uh, urinal. Saw his thing. Oh, yeah, you were looking. Yeah, unfortunately. So, now did this guy grow up near a nuclear power plant or something? I worked hard to suppress that scene. Doesn't make it go away. That's I've added a couple cool. more just to compensate for how long and excruciating that was. But despite the bumps in the road, it does show the importance of addressing anger in a healthy way. Total raging out is never the best idea. But acting like the anger isn't there is equally as bad, because it boils. Strange. In cooking terms, anger boils, but rage simmers. So, at what temperature does anger boil over into rage? Let's ask Chef Ramsay. The path to addressing suppressed rage is a long one, but eventually comes to the big conclusion as David storms the field at Yankee Stadium to profess before everyone how he really feels about his girlfriend by kissing her in public something he's been reluctant to do since the incident. It seems like this that set this film apart from the rest of Adam Sandler's work. Great build-up, emotional upwelling, completely devoid of his usual cliches. You can do it, David! Give her a five-second friendship! Fine. You can do it! No use hiding the truth. Despite its reliance on the usual formula, anger management succeeds in tackling a majority of anger issues while also being entertaining. And while it won't leave you overwhelmed by its insight, it might spark those not usually self-aware to consider their own emotional health. A gateway drug to introspection targeted at a demographic that doesn't usually seek it could actually be a great thing. And none of it would be possible without the social manipulation of psychologically evaluated patients. Thanks for helping me see that, Psycho. You're welcome. Can I choose my own films now? Actually, I found this left on my doorstep this morning. Is it yours? You, you hold on to that for me. I'm going... No, it's in it. Poor man. I'm the other socio, and I will choose my films more wisely from here on out.